Oh, somewhere in the back. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight to the Bay Area Mesos meetup. We're all very happy to have you here. Um, just quickly, I'm going to introduce, introduce our speakers. We have Neil Gehani, who is the product manager at Mesosphere. Um, Abdel Dridi, who is the big data lead at 4C. Jonathan Bennett, VP of Engineering at Zeus. And Oliver Gold, CTO at Voyant. Um, we're just going to get started straight into it. Um, I'll welcome to, uh, Neil to the stage. Hopefully I won't knock this beer over. Uh, good evening. Wow, it's good to see all of you. It's uh, great. This is my third month here at Mesosphere. So I'm still relatively new. So I maybe goof off this presentation like a million times before it's over. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, developing and deploying on Mesosphere DCOS. So we'll get right into it. And uh, a little bit about me. Uh, when I'm not crashing on my bike, I'm trying to stay upright on the hills in Bay Area. I've uh, been around for a while uh, developing code previously, and now I've been a PM for the last uh, 10 years. Um, let me show, take a show of hands. How many here are developing or building uh, microservices? Okay, a few. Okay, cool. So most of you are pretty familiar with the modern release processes. Uh, people are used to doing this now. How many people are following these, this sort of process where it's very iterative, quick iterations, shipping very quickly? You guys are doing that? Okay. So the world is moving to building applications that are uh, requiring faster and faster speeds. Uh, and there's a reason for why it's requiring faster and faster speeds, primarily for competitive pressures. Uh, market demands is, is forcing companies to, to react and deliver value faster and faster. So that's, that's what we're talking about here, the modern release process. And the more applications, the more services you build, um, the more complex it becomes because now as you move into taking a big, large monolith and splitting it up into a bunch of little services, uh, you're dependent on all these services running as a system, um, and you want to be able to take not only your stateless services, but all your stateful applications and run it somewhere on a platform, and you got to mix it up with a whole bunch of traditional applications that also has got to run somewhere. And so DCOS tries to solve a lot of those problems. Just to sort of level set, uh, when I think about the taxonomy, uh, about how we think about these workloads, we think of applications as, as services primarily, and services are what uh, delivers the business value to the customer. Uh, cloud native, when we, people think about cloud native, we think about them as sort of a design pattern uh, in how you build apps. You can have monoliths that are, that are cloud native. Uh, microservices are sort of an architectural pattern. Uh, containers obviously are very, very portable. And the platform, which is, which is what we do here, uh, is what you would use to actually deploy your services. Uh, and we, we take care of the underlying uh, deployment onto the infrastructure and having it run. Infrastructure is really where your services run. Um, DevOps is just a practice of, of software development. In terms of looking at the workloads, if you look at the workloads themselves, you've got traditional uh, monoliths and, and, and databases. Um, and when you move into the modern apps, uh, a lot of those are, are cloud native, stateless microservices, stateful DBs, and then those stateful big data uh, or distributed databases. Like these are the workloads we think about uh, deploying. So you want all of those workloads really running on some platform. And so you're going to have a mixture of these workloads. Um, and the reason this is important now is because as you move to this what I said earlier about you know, delivering very, very quickly, um, there's, a, there's low risk if you're trying to deliver faster because you're working on smaller pieces of code. You know, if you have to like, change a big monolith, there's like, too many cooks in the kitchen, there's more chances of things to go wrong, there could be more security uh, uh, issues in, in multiple people working on, on big changes. So having small changes, small pieces of code, uh, getting delivered faster is, is very important. Uh, the one thing that people talk about a lot here is, is or in the industry in general, they talk about CI and, and CD. And, and I want to make a separation between 
what CI is and, and what CD is. Uh, and everybody sort of conflates the two. They sort of talk about it in the same sentence. Uh, CI is the integration part of it, the build and test part of it, sort of what Jenkins does, or Travis, or Circle, or any of these tools. Uh, CD is the most important part. Uh, if you don't really deliver your applications running somewhere, it doesn't really matter. You haven't really delivered value. People have to actually see it, use it. And so when I talk about uh, continuous delivery, it's talking about services that are actually delivered, uh, i.e. ready, ready to be used. And that is the actual delivery part. The deployment part is that's actually running. Somebody can actually use it. You know, the, the goal for, for most modern teams who are like what Amazon calls two pizza teams, where the shipping uh, extremely fast where they own it end to end like my Amazon describes them you build it you own it So the teams that own it have to deliver their their code and it's always ready When you turn it on or when you expose it to the user That's the deployment aspect of it and you can you can choose how to do that in uh, various different ways So the CI part is like performing the code analysis the unit tests uh, the integration tests that that's considered continuous integration uh, the hard part comes in when you have to dynamically provision the environments. Uh, you declare your environments, you know, whether it's YAML or JSON files, and you automatically create the provision the environments, and you need to have an infrastructure or a platform that allows you to do that. Part of that provisioning also means provisioning the underlying servers, the underlying VMs, or, a physical infra or running on a physical infrastructure, or provisioning in, in AWS, or provisioning in, in Azure. All of those you have to do automatically when you, need, when you need it, at the time you need it. And then you actually end up having to deliver and deploy your applications to, a, to those environments. If you think about a traditional team, each team has their own tooling. Uh, they, will, they will use their own tools, whether it be Git, GitLab, or Jenkins, or JFrog, or whatever. Each team will do that. But then each team has to maintain this. Okay? They got to deal with the upgrades. Um, they like to use their own tools. Everybody's got their own special choices. You got to spin up your own CD pipelines. Uh, and teams can do this, and it's great, but then teams have to maintain them. Now, in some large companies, they will have some central organization that will try to maintain them. Uh, but that becomes very hard in terms of your company's point of view, because you got to manage the infrastructure, you got to make sure that your infrastructure is utilized properly. And so what we allow you to do with DCOS is to have uh, things like Jenkins or GitLab or your artifactory uh, repository, your container repository, and your artifact repository all on the same, same platform. To deploy Jenkins is one click. Right? You don't have to worry. Any team can come in and just go, I want another instance, click. And they can spin up another instance. In our service catalog, that's where we have a lot of, lot of the applications and services, whether it be GitLab, whether it be you know, JFrog's uh, Artifactory, whether it be Nexus's Sonar type. You know, we give you the tools of your choice, and you can add your own tools in, into the catalog, and you can deploy them pretty easily. And that's one of the big pluses for having your services run on DCOS. So what we end up doing is basically abstracting all of that underlying hard stuff. Uh, and DCOS provides the, the platform for you to basically deploy any service you want. It also gives you a very easy way to create your own services um, and, and deploy those. So fundamentally, there's three problems that we want to solve. One is to make sure that it's every development team, it's self-service. Uh, for CI/CD, and that's what uh, the platform enables. You can uh, scale your services, uh, service instances on demand, regardless of the uh, the environment. You get the ability to also do elastic scaling of your instances, uh, as well as uh, resource optimization at the same time. And the nice thing also is it allows you to run both traditional and modern apps on the same infrastructure. And that's important. So let's take a look at what this looks like. You have a typical CD pipeline here. 
when you do a git push goes into a version control system you know either be github or or gitlab you can use any one and then it uh, triggers a ci build through jenkins uh, it creates the artifact puts it in either some some artifact repository and then marathon which is our scheduler that actually schedules the workloads onto mesos and then there's a there's a load balancer in front of it those are those components are all part of dcos uh, and they're built in they're out of the box uh, you don't need to do anything other than use them the nice thing is you can do this for your single command line or or a click um, once the service is installed it can be run uh, you know, in the entire data center because we, we treat the whole data center like one giant machine. So we're sharing all the resources underneath. So whether you have big workloads, stateless workloads, stateful workloads, all of those workloads are running on the same, same cluster in the same data center or across multiple data centers. If you think about it, the whole application lifecycle can basically run on DCOS, everything from any environment, from the dev environment to staging and testing uh, to production. And it's the same, the same infrastructure across all of these environments. These environments, as I said before, they're dynamically provisioned, so you can actually declare them and, and create the environments on the fly. So it saves a lot of time for developers who are troubleshooting any environment issues and you can uh, provide easier experimentation. You also have one API to deploy anywhere in any cloud infrastructure. Uh, no complex deployment scripts. Uh, you don't have to worry about writing, you know, Chef or Puppet. Uh, we give you the capability to do that out of the box. Uh, so we don't, we don't lock you into any particular infrastructure. We'll take the Strava use case. I'm a biker, so that's, that's the use case that I'm going to use. They're down the street here somewhere. Uh, you know, pre-DCOS, took them 30 minutes plus. You know, after DCOS, less than a minute. So I'm going to open it up to questions before I turn it over to the next, next speaker. Well, it's, it's, yeah, so it depends on what you mean. Like, you can have multiple uh, clusters and multiple data centers. Sure. That's the uh, question. Single but, but single cluster, uh, not from a, like, a viewpoint, like, that's the next thing to look from a management point of view, to look at it as there's one big cluster. But there's different use cases for that. Like, what are you trying to do? If you have, uh, are you doing it for um, failover reasons? Are you doing it for... Uh, bursting from one data center to another like there's different use cases that 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 come to mind when you're thinking about multiple data centers so it depends on each of your use cases uh you know we we have a hybrid cloud strategy to to deal with that i think the first thing we're dealing with is unifying the management across multiple data centers that's our that's the first step in the process uh the dr probably uh you know there's some some elements of disaster recovery uh that we're looking at but we have a roadmap to deal with some of those other issues as they become uh, important. So right now we multiple clusters, but it's a single thing. Yes, from a management point of view, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so in terms of the, so public and private cloud is like private cloud it's it, we think of it as like okay you treat your data center as, as as a private cloud so if i install dcos on my own on-prem data center it makes it look like a cloud in on-prem uh public cloud is things okay i'm going to use amazon or or azure or or google yeah we you know you can have dcos if you're running it on amazon then it it makes it look the same way that it looks on on-prem we we treat it like a set of 
uh, resources on Amazon, we don't really care where, where those are. Uh, we, we treat them the same way we would treat them on-prem. It just looks like one giant computer to us. It depends on what you provision on, on Amazon. Uh, it depends on what you mean by security aspects of, of uh, public and private cloud. I think a lot of the uh, security features, uh, a lot of it is on the enterprise version of, of DCOS. Uh, so obviously it's not the same set you will get in open source, but yeah, I mean, those are the things that we actually do think about a lot here. <laughs> we put a lot of effort into that, uh, that effort, but it depends on what you mean by security. Do you have a specific uh, issue in mind? Sorry? Ah, uh, yeah. Compliance is a big topic, uh, but it's also very broad in terms of uh, security. So again, we'll have to look at like catch me after, and then we can talk about what specific use case uh, with regards to compliance. Most of the compliance issues and security generally for like financial institutions and things like that, or HIPAA compliance for, uh, for healthcare, uh, those types of things are going to be in the enterprise version of, of DCOS. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Abdo Dridi, um, the big data lead at 4C. Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, today I would like actually to present to you um, a way actually to maximize resources utilization on, uh, on Mesos. The idea that Mesos was able actually to give us an optimization on the hardware level, there is, we think there is another important optimization as well on the, uh, on the software level or on the application level. So um, um, microservices could be implemented with different technology and um, different architectures. And um, uh, the idea to have actually different ways gives us actually a chance to choose and to, uh, to, get, to get the right technology that gives us the best uh, and the most optimal solutions. So in our case, we tried actually the Spring Boot, the Node.js, as well as what we call Vertex. And all those are different like uh, kind of architecture, tools, frameworks that allow us to write performant and scalable microservices. Um, uh, just to go quick in the, in the, in, in the DCOS level, so uh, we just like wrote the same exact 
kind of app using the three different technologies. So we wrote the same thing on, on Spring and we deployed two instances and um, uh, kind of the minimal requirement that allow the app to work nicely is like it's actually two gig as memory, pretty much one CPU and the size is around like almost a gig of, uh, uh, of data. Uh, so you write your Spring app and you just like Dockerize it and you load it to your uh, Docker hub and then you try to deploy it directly from the Mesos. I will show you in the end a little bit of code regarding that. Then we did the same thing with Node and two instances again and um, memory wise, was one gig almost half of, of what Spring needs. So at least here tells you like, if you wanna uh, choose between Spring Boot, Docker, or a, a Node.js that is self-contained and deployed directly to Mesos, you, uh, to the COS, you can have that much of optimization. Then we actually did what we call Vertex, and here's the most important. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Make sure that my uh, actually uh, screen is shared. Okay. You see it now? All right. Okay, there we go. So, and we try to, uh, to do the same thing using uh, Vertex. Vertex is actually a micro container, uh, microservices that allow us to write really uh, 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 tiny services, if you wanna call it, and deploy it directly. So the same code, the same kind of uh, functionality running on Vertex, you only need like almost like 5% or what Spring needs. And um, uh, 128 meg was more than enough for the uh, for the for 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 Dex to run comfortably and nicely on Mesos. Um, uh, the size globally of the app is like around eight meg. So again, size-wise, uh, resources-wise, it uses much less. So if you guys want to actually um, uh, compare the ratio between the three different technology we have chosen here, you will actually note that um, uh, in order to, uh, instead of deploying one Spring Boot uh, Docker app, you can deploy instead 16 uh, pretty much uh, Vertex services doing the same thing. And so this gives you guys an idea about like choosing the right technology and the right kind of architecture for microservices, you can have another uh, optimization on the resource level, beside the one that DCOS and Mesos gives you. And um, uh, this is pretty much globally um, uh, a performance chart, where actually, you know, it's like in this case, Vertex can do like almost 700,000 messages a second, while um, Spring is down here like almost 1% of that. So, um, uh, very quickly, why Vertex? So, um, Vertex is a, uh, is a reactive micro container. You can implement your microservices. It's a polyglot platform. So, don't say, okay, it's a Java, and if I need, uh, for example, Groovy or JavaScript or Python or whatever, I would have issues. So, it's a polyglot platform, and actually, that's really nice for uh, for the Mesos utility and the Mesos kind of uh, offering because you can do your machine learning microservices, you can do your uh, a RESTful interface, you can uh, put everything and make it as like coexistence within the same cluster. It's simple and powerful. It uses actually non-blocking, which means asynchronous, and therefore um, you can actually load uh, more data and you can consume and process more messages. Um, if you know the actor uh, kind of uh, architecture, that's what brought by, um, uh, by the Scala kind of microservices. So it's an actor-like concurrency, um, have small footprint, 
and it's a lightweight, you can actually um, communicate or manage to communicate your services using uh, a lightweight event bus. It's single-threaded, so you can have actually an actor or a vector per core. So if you have four cores, so you will have four almost uh, simultaneous threads running. Um, no transactions because it's asynchronous, so it's um, a fire and forget, and there is a callback whenever the response is ready. Uh, very quickly, actually, the difference between the existing, at least, uh, client-server communication and the one offered by Vertex is that you don't need to wait for a request, but you can fire as much as you want and um, uh, let the server answer when um, uh, it takes care of it. So if you noticed, in Spring, we need actually Docker to contain the service. In, um, in uh, Vertex, we didn't need that. So it's a micro container, self-contained. That's why the size is very, very small. It's like eight meg. Eight meg, you, that's, that's the whole size of the service. So if you look a little bit and uh, have a little bit of history, before we used to have uh, a single machine, single hardware, where you have the apps installed on top, then things move to VMs, where we start actually to doing isolation. And then came in Docker. So Docker is a good thing, right? It gives a lot of uh, uh, added value. But the issue is, if you keep deploying your services as Docker containers, you have the overhead that it's been added by each container. So you might actually think and say, OK, there might be actually better technology that does not allow me or does that allow me uh, to, to actually minimize, optimize that overhead that Docker adds. So at least in this case, we don't use Docker to deploy microservices. And actually, it allows us to uh, uh, use more resources, more services, deploy more services with less resources. Um, very quickly, uh, to show some of the, of the apps running. So um, our application uh, are being deployed in, uh, in Mesos, in uh, DCOS. So those are the nodes that's been deployed. These are the configuration associated with it. We, um, uh, so you can actually discover load balance route everything through Linkerd. Linkerd is really a great discovery service that even has um, uh, a monitoring uh, app associated with it, which is called Linkerviz, which we use and we rely on it. And then um, you are able actually to see here like how many uh, calls has been made, uh, how many failures, and uh, as well as like uh, a clear uh, like graph about the performance that each um, app gave us, gave us. And um, as well as the latency, if you notice know here like Spring apps, they have really um, uh, an important latency compared to others, which are around like um, three, two seconds compared to almost like 200. Um, uh, I think pretty much it from my side. Um, there is the code is here in GitHub and it's public. You guys can actually play with it and uh, deploy it and discover that doing things in Vertex or even Node.js can give you actually or can um, allow you to use more resources with, I mean, deploy more services with less resources. Questions? Uh, you can let me uh, let us have uh, the URL for where that uh, code is on, on GitHub. Uh, yeah, this is the the URL oh, for the. Okay, code. can I take a picture of it or something then? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a picture of it. I got another question, but unless somebody else wants one while I'm doing this. Okay. No. Like it. Oh. Do you do you see it? Okay. Okay. Hello. Uh, so I have a just question. Can you just talk a bit about uh, Vertex and Node.js, just kind of what the pros and cons are? So um, uh, Node.js actually was um, uh, uh, a step 
uh, that came after the synchronous architecture. So um, the difference, the main difference between Node.js and actually and uh, and uh, uh, and Vertex are the asynchronous uh, kind of behavior and the non-blocking that Vertex can give you. The idea that you can actually send as many requests as you want without actually waiting for a response back and the response back will be processed and a callback will be coming to you it gives you that non-blocking IO. It gives you non-blocking uh, uh, non-blocking requests. It's pretty much like you are not waiting but you keep sending and waiting for responses to come back. That's one. And two, Vertex is actually polyglot. So you can write JavaScript on, you can use JavaScript apps, you can use Vertex to write them, Java, uh, Groovy, uh, Python, uh, and many others. So in today's world, as you know, like things are optimized by language pretty much. So there is languages that are good with, with uh, different kind of apps or different needs or different user requirement and others they are kind of uh, more important. So it gives you an idea that hey, you can actually use your language without losing the, the capability. So the capability is the same and you can write it with the language you, you want. Especially if you have like um, legacy apps in your, in your environment as well as machine learning which are mainly on Python or uh, data science uh, kind of uh, uh, services so all of them they can coexist using the same platform and they can communicate with each other easily as well okay. um, um, how how mature is it I mean because I mean doc has been around for a while at least um, LXC has been around for a long time and they have a lot of the bells and whistles like networking and all that kind of you know some security ports for laughter but around docker so how mature is Vertex right now? The technology is quite mature. They were actually, um, they won the most innovative uh, kind of architecture in 2000, 2014, in Java 1. Um, they're quite mature and um, there's a lot of people using them and you can check it out. It's vertex.io and, um, and we, we've been using them and we, I've been using them as well before in uh, my old company. They are in production, yes. That's right, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Abba. <laughs> All right, so for our final talk of the night, we have um, Jonathan Bennett and Oliver Gold. Come on up to the stage. I'm assuming everyone else's desktop looks like this too, right? Is it just me? Okay. Oh, and everyone has like 60 million tabs open as well. Cool. I closed them just for this, so we're really lucky. Is it not done? Oh dear, that's bad. No, it's not. Don't worry, Don't worry about it. You don't have to, don't have to stop me. Sweet. Cool. It's all good. Sweet, okay, so we're the last one, so hopefully try and not be too boring, so apologies. Um, so what we wanted to do is we want to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of our real life uh, scenarios of using both DCOS and Linkerd now in production as of two weeks ago, um, much to the surprise of various other people, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we've uh, been working really hard on this and I want to share some of the learnings and experiences, as I said. Um, so about us, um, you probably haven't heard of us, we're a massive startup that 
no one's yet really heard of over here yet. We're expanding. We have an office on Pacific Avenue, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, we're based in four countries, uh, UK. You can't hear? No. OK, sorry. OK, cool. Um, 45 million to date, uh, 80 plus employees, tens of millions of payments uh, a month. And obviously, we take payments 24 7. Here's all the various pieces of information about me. If you want to find me, don't, but there we go. Cool. Um, all good? Everyone happy? Everyone can hear? Yeah? Good. OK, cool. Um, so I want to give you a bit of a background about why we're even here and why we even did this, because uh, as I said, we're six and a half years old, and we kind of really need to grow. Um, so like all good startups, we started as a monolith. So we took a lot of the learnings that we tried to have in the first talk, and then we kind of pivoted once, and then twice, and then three times. And the code base never actually changed. So it was a Java app sitting on a MySQL database. It did the job really, really well, but then we started to scale, and then we started to talk about distributed systems and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, we moved from a pair table restaurant service, really, really great, way out of its time, that was six years ago. And then we moved to a single line integration checkout, kind of like the Stripe idea again, that was nearly four and a half years ago. And then we pivoted again to be a single API driven uh, for all of your payments needs and become a technology platform above the gateways. Kind of think of it like a super gateway. Uh, but that meant availability was really key and scalability was really key, agility and those kind of other things. So we need to do something different. And I kind of wanted to kind of tell you before we go into what we did, why we did it. Um, so we really wanted to deal with high volumes of traffic. We're already talking about thousands of transactions a minute. So we really need to raise that a level above uh, and make it more resilient and kind of really just not lose sleep at night. Uh, everyone talks about kind of ops and all that kind of other stuff. We don't believe in that, Azuz. Um, so everything has to be automated, available all the time, self-healing, blah, blah, blah. So we needed a platform that could do that. Um, we needed to offer really high levels of availability. Um, so 99.99 is our old uh, availability number. We're now at 99.99.9, nine, five nines. Five nines, yeah, five nines. Uh, and we want to offer this to the merchants and technology partners so that they're able to basically experience the level of uptime that other payment providers aren't necessarily able to give them at this point in time. Um, and so we need to solve that. Um, everyone talks about APIs, but there are very few out there that are like really nice to use. Um, Stripe is a, a formidable adversary, but one of our favorite peoples. But um, we really wanted to get a modern standards API uh, approach. And one of the things that we heard in the first talk about CI and, and CD as, as two integrated approaches, um, kind of we encompasses agility. We needed to be able to do things really quick, and we'll come on to how we achieve that with, uh, with DCOS. So when we talk about the tenants of our platform, our product is called Payments OS. Uh, we broke everything down into four major categories, and we needed to solve each of one of these uh, problems by basically enabling it through technology. Um, we looked at agility and rapid iteration, global distribution, CDNs, all that kind of other stuff, single points of failure, people, technology, various others, uh, and future flexibility. So we don't know what we don't know, and part of that's through our API's first strategy and kind of other things. Cool. I don't know if anyone knows the payment world. I'm trying not to bore you, to bore you too much and get to the interesting stuff. But um, we have really super strict security requirements, PCI level one. If anyone's ever done retail, you know it's like the longest paperwork you've ever had to fill out. But it's really important. Um, we have a strict no, no downtime policy for our API services. Um, internally, we're constructed of tons and tons of APIs now. 90 plus different services are comprised of our entire infrastructure, which is why the platform is really important. All the testing must be automated. That seems really weird to say in 2016, but it's unbelievable how many people actually still don't have automated testing. And it really, really, really is important. Um, and then all deployments must be completely automated. I think that's really, really key. Um, and when we were kind of building the platform and we were designing what it would be, this was one of the things that we found was one of the most undermature uh, elements of, of our space. Like all good companies, we talk about containers, 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 blah, 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 blah. We obviously have a lot of faith in container technologies, you know, whether it be Docker, LXC is where we started. Um, it kind of shows how not old I am, but I am older than I look. Um, so yeah, so we needed to push our isolation forward. So we played with LXC and we kind of just said, uh, what's the point in building the, the wheel again? Let's just kind of go with Docker and just figure it out from there. Really good fun. And we'll take the operational overhead over. We have a massive culture of polyglot programmers here at Zoos. We program in Java, Scala, Node, and Go. Um, and we needed to basically support a equally easy environment for all of our different uh, application stacks. Um, and obviously, containers permit us to do that and push those very, very frequently, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we uh, orchestrate our really complicated environments using things like Ansible and now, as you're going to find out, DCOS to do that. Um, and we pushed 40,000 builds last month. Um, using DCOS, which is a number kind of on the CI/CD slides that the Mesosphere guys really like hearing. Uh, but yeah, 40,000 builds last month, and it goes up every single month. We're actually 40 developers too, which of, of which 10 are 
Bay engineers and tour ops and kind of other things. So I can give you the breakdown if anyone was interested at the end. It's actually one of the things that enabled us. Um, again, like the first talk, um, if you build it, you run it as zoos. Um, the idea is the platform is a thing that we run for you as infrastructure team, and then you basically run your applications on top of that. Your Docker containers, your apps, your health checks, everything else are all basically owned and managed by you. Um, so DCOS was one of the key reasons that we even uh, are able to do this inside our organization, because I don't know if anyone's ever run containers at any kind of scale. It's not trivial, um, and that's why there's so many different solutions. And, and we really did a lot of evaluation work before we ended up with uh, DCOS, about now what we're running. Um, and one of the reasons we chose it, and one of the reasons we needed to worry about a scheduler was because we needed to give our engineers that stability on their own. I didn't want to have to kind of build monolithic operations teams or worry about too much there. So a scheduler was really, really key here. Um, the application runtime uh, being scaled and restarted, triaged, debugged at runtime was really important for us. Um, and obviously in engineering, as you guys know, if we're talking about automation, health checks become really, really important. Therefore, a solid health check framework is really important. And then an orchestrator is really important, which is where Marathon came in. I'm assuming you guys, if you're interested in DCOS, know about Marathon, but it's the, the puppet arm on top of your containers inside of Mesos. I did a bit bad job. Sorry, Mesosphere guys. Um, but anyway, so in, in, in Zoos, you build it, you run it. So we needed this platform. We needed a way of orchestrating our containers at pretty phenomenal scale. We're running thousands of containers now. Uh, the, the scheduler is obviously a really important core component of that. Uh, we needed to be developer friendly. You know, don't want to scare people away with massive APIs, which is one of the reasons we didn't go with Kubernetes, because the API is really nice, but it's uh, not yet quite there. It wasn't there when we went forward. Uh, it needs to be oper easy to operate and upgrade. We actually automated our entire deployment end to end. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And obviously, we need to support the, the overall business goals of optimization cost and money spent while deploying and time spent while deploying. Um, it's one of the things that we talk about the least. But actually, our overall TCO for our application platform decreased phenomenally. We went from hundreds of servers down to tens of servers when we moved to DCOS, purely by a method of compaction. And you know that was one of the major pieces. So obviously we chose DCOS, that's why we're here. Um, so why did we choose DCOS? Um, so we obviously spent a lot of time evaluating all kinds of options, nearly a quarter of full-time ops engineer resource, kind of methodically taking all these different environments, whether it be DCOS, whether it be the ECS on Amazon, Kubernetes, Nomad, or, or Lattice, and Cloud Foundry, Lattice being the new runtime for Cloud Foundry. And we kind of just really focused on two, with Kubernetes and Mesos, DCOS at the time was DCOS Enterprise, as before the, the open source offering. Uh, and we kind of were really trying to figure out which one we wanted to use. At the time, so this was March 2016, when we made our platform uh, selection, Kubernetes still felt unfinished. I think um, that's no longer necessarily the case, but we really love Mesos. And again, uh, this was one of the core reasons that we chose DCOS. And obviously, at the time, DCOS, and still today, DCOS felt like a much more robust, rounded system. And it really just worked out of the box. We orchestrated a lot of things on it and, and kind of did a lot there. Um, we also use Mesos a lot for orchestrating analytics runtimes um, and for using all the uh, spare compute capacity, again, that, uh, lowering that TCO of our application stack. So our current uh, application size is, uh, again, you hear in the first talk when you're talking about environments, we run uh, over 250 nodes of DCOS across uh, all of our environments. We run four environments right now today, um, development, quality, pre-production, which we lovingly call Mars, and uh, production environments. Um, and our production environment is roughly 100 nodes spanned across two regions and five AZs um, inside of Amazon uh, AWS. I know there's a question about regions and federation. Um, so we took quite a practical approach to this. We use actually one region as like a, well, they're both active regions, but we actually deploy to one region silently beforehand to make sure we don't take out both at once. So federation is just one way of achieving that, we, we kind of saw it as a benefit to manage this all ourselves. Interestingly enough, and we're doing a lot more to give back to the community because, of course, we use DCS open source, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, so uh, we actually automated the entire deployment of DCOS using Ansible. We now spring entire DCO, DCOS clusters in under 15 minutes, entire application stacks in under 30, wherever we can basically get compute resource. Um, that's something we'll be giving back, and there's various other things we'll be giving back to. So yeah, so we currently do two regions of five AZs. So kind of we achieved this over a really short period of time, again, as one of the reasons why DCOS was so important for us. So for the beginning of our development journey, again, I said we're six and a half years old, we started back in June, and we ended up going from idea, conception of what was called the Payments OS to production in six months. That included turning all of our monolithic Java application developers through to polyglot programmers in containers in production. 
we're no longer, we're not, absolutely not there, kind of like perfect, but the engineers and ops and everyone else that we have involved in this entire, I want to say marathon, but it's more like a mega sprint, um, really kind of pulled it out. So yeah, that was six months and that included a huge amount of upskilling. Obviously, we love Mesos. Uh, we use several major Mesos frameworks, both developed by the Mesosphere guys, where Cassandra and Kafka. But we've actually developed um, the only HashiCorp Vault framework that also does automated unsealing. That's one of the things we'll also be giving back in the next week to the community. So if anyone's interested in helping us with that, then please let us know. Um, but we use Vault at pretty phenomenal scale, um, and we needed it to be completely automated. So deploying that on Mesos was really important. So again, more reasons. We talk about Spark. We talk about uh, using Cassandra as our data lake. We're able to do that purely because of Mesos and DCOS. Um, so that's it. Now, with our build test deploy frameworks, as mentioned before, CI and CD, we do both because you have to do both, or I recommend you do both. You don't have to, but I really do recommend you do. Um, we were able to focus on pushing software fast to production. And as I said, we did 40,000 deployments in 2016, um, 8,000 of which were production release candidates. So you can see the kind of phenomenal capacity that we're pushing at now. Um, and actually, the next part of this talk, which is really kind of where it gets really exciting and not boring like this, um, is how we actually achieve that really safety net um, of deployment and deploying at that kind of level uh, through the guys at, at, at Linkerd. That was really, really important to us. So we're really proud to be a, a good friend of the Buoyant guys who are coming after this, which kind of brings us on to the next problem. So we've got this amazing platform. We've got these containers running. We've got Mesos DNS, which is fantastic most of the time. Um, and uh, it's really great, but that doesn't help with any of the load balancing. It doesn't help with any of the back off, circuit breaking, any of those kind of other pieces. So we needed to think about how we root in a platform like this. And deploying an ELB is not the solution at this kind of scale. Um, so we started building our own router. We started looking at our own RPC frameworks. We talked about doing gRPC. We talked about like all these other various things, ribbon from Netflix, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and actually, we uh, settled on Finagle. And then that's where we found the Linker, the Linkerd guys, or the, Bi the Buoyant guys. Um, so we wanted to make use of all the core pieces of DCOS, all the core pieces of Mesos um, to basically mean that our developers don't need to know where anything is. They have a predefined addressable infrastructure. They just have a DNS name. Application name in Mesos, root to it. You know, if the if the uh, security allows you to get to it, you can get to it. If it doesn't, then good luck. And that, that's kind of how it works. So super predictability, cross-region load balancing, cross-region DNS, um, federated DNS, which we again uh, orchestrated and set up, and we'll uh, probably look at giving back as well. Uh, but we needed to root. So we needed an RPC framework. We're lucky, um, as I'm sure you guys know. There's lots of papers and implementations of uh, RPC frameworks out there with Netflix Ribbon, which was like the first one in like 2013, I think. I don't know whether that, the Twitter guys will probably, uh, ex-Twitter guys will probably correct me if I'm wrong. But then obviously Twitter put out Finagle, which is their giant RPC framework, which of course is what Linkerd is uh, based upon. Circuit breaking or retries, I won't try and presuppose any of that piece because uh, the Linkerd guys will tell you much more about that. So I'm going to hand on to the Linkerd guys who are going to tell you more about how we use Linkerd in production right now. Uh, howdy. All right. Can I just take this and pop out? Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Thanks, JB. This is a really interesting talk. Uh, it's, I, I've been talking to JB for about a year, and we, we just met yesterday for the first time. So it's really open source is a funny thing. Um, I encourage you to do it. Uh, so who here, but before I get into this, who here before tonight has heard of Linkerd? Okay, that's some of you. That's a good start. Um, who here can tell me what Linkerd is? Uh, OK. Well, that, that, there you go, Matt. Thank you. All right. Who can tell me what a service mesh is? Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, so anyway, my name is Oliver. I'm the CTO of Buoyant. We started the company about two years ago. Um, the open source project I spend most of my time on is called Linkerd. It's been open source for about a year. I'll talk a level about that today. Um, yeah, let's just get into that. And so we, we came up with this idea of a service mesh. And so a service mesh is really that you have these services running somewhere, and they, they have to deal with talking to each other. When we're talking about microservices, we're really talking about communication between services. And so really what I want to do, I just want to deploy these things into a mesh and let the connectivity issues be handled by the infrastructure. And that's what we try to do with Linkerd. And so what we can do here is we can deploy a polyglot environment, like JB described, uh, so Linkerd doesn't care anything really about the libraries being used or the languages being used. Really all it cares about is the traffic going through it. 
And so we, we focus on RPC being HTTP or Thrift or gRPC. Uh, we can support other protocols as well. Uh, but the, the idea here is that you deploy one Linkerd per DCOS instance, for instance. Uh, everything on that node sends traffic through the local host, and Linkerd deals with service discovery, routing, retries, timeouts, all the hard stuff. Uh, so to quickly go, yeah, service discovery is kind of the big feature you get out of the box. You don't have to build service discovery into your application. If you're dealing with Zookeeper, this means you don't have to write a Zookeeper client or a Zookeeper service at client. I've done this. It's hard to do right. It's very buggy. Durability is another really hard problem to solve in a polyglot environment. So let's say I want to monitor success rate or latency. Uh, well, what if the latency histograms aren't really calculated the same between two different implementations? I have a Go process that exposes stats in one format, and a Python process that exposes stats in another format. And how do I monitor success rate or, or latency uniformly across my cluster? Well, when I've deployed Linkerd, I have a uniform set of stats that I can look at for anything in the system and have some data about it. Is it healthy? Is the success rate good? Or is it retrying? Uh, we have a bunch of dynamic traffic control features, which is some of the stuff that we're looking forward to working on JB about uh, with during uh, deploy automation. Uh, this deals with things like blue-green deploys, so I stand up a new cluster and slowly roll traffic onto it. Uh, also, things like multi-zone, so I can send traffic between zones, I can fail over between zones, I can fail over between service instances. Uh, we have a lot of operational features. Uh, so this all comes out of work we did at Twitter. Uh, I was just doing some math. I've been working on Linkerd for about two years now. But the underlying tech here, Finagle, uh, Netty, I've been working on at Twitter, including over the last five years or so. So this is a, a pretty mature platform we've built on. This Vax, Twitter.com, Pinterest, uh, this tech stack that we built Linkerd in backs a lot of large production websites. Uh, and the features, especially around canary deploys, blue-green deploys, uh, and circuit breaking, uh, SLA management, all come out of real incidents, uh, most of which I've been woken up for, or somebody I know has been woken up for. And so, so there's a lot of uh, empathy, hopefully, built into Linkerd. Uh, so to go quickly through some, some of these topics, service discovery load balancing is probably the key thing that you're thinking about if you're going to look at Linkerd. You have some apps running. You don't want to build services given to your app. You don't know whether you're going to use Zookeeper or console. Maybe you're using both at the same time, because that happens for weird reasons. Uh, and so Linkerd is built to be very pluggable. Uh, we have plugins for Marathon, for Zookeeper, for Kubernetes, for console, for etcd. You sit this in there. They can layer in. And now I have a, a connectivity layer without application, uh, uh, without any code change, really. Uh, built into Linkerd is a request level load balancer. So this is. If you think about load balancers, you usually think about layer four TCP load balancers. These are really naive. They have uh, basically round robin or fewest connections is the best you can do. When you're dealing with uh, per request load balancing, I can actually deal look at latency of individual requests or throughput of streams and use the actual latency information of that request to, or of that endpoint uh, to inform the load balancer. And so this is stuff that's used in production heavily at Twitter. Uh, to improve reliability substantially. So one of the examples I usually use is if you're talking to a 10-node cluster, and one of these instances in the 10-node cluster starts to fail a timeout, it will push you about 95% success rate a lot of the time, uh, which in all of my on-call rotations is going to wake me up success rate. Uh, so, I prefer, so what we can do just by changing the load balancing algorithm to use P2C or Yuma um, in, in Linkerd, this is a config option you can use. It can push this up over three nines just by changing the load balancing algorithm. So there's a lot of operational help just in service discovery and load balancing, nothing else. Once you have that, uh, you saw this nice dashboard that we saw before. Uh, we actually just get a bunch of data for free. And so this, by sending traffic through Linkerd, Linkerd is recording counters, it's recording histograms, it exports this in a uniform way. We can use Prometheus to aggregate this across a cluster and give you really good insight into what's going on without knowing anything about the processes. I don't care what language you're in. We can tell you your success rate. We can tell you your latency information if you're sending requests to Linkerd. Uh, another thing that comes not for free, so everything else I've talked about is basically for free. If you make a little bit of code change to pass headers through, we can also instrument tracing for you for free. Anyone heard of the Zipkin project? 
Zipkin project is something uh, my team at Twitter, uh, the observability team at Twitter open sourced a couple of years ago. It's been revamped since. Uh, and now we have this great foundation for just emitting data in a sampled way out of Linkerd to Zipkin. And then I can build really nice topology information. I can build call graphs. And we can use this to find a bugging. Like, should I spend 600 milliseconds in this Git? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, at least these things are all parallel, right? Um, so that, but these things are sequential. It shows you a lot of information. And these are things we can get for free with just passing headers through your application. As of yesterday, we gave Linkerd to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So it's uh, a sister project to Kubernetes and Prometheus and FluentD and OpenTracing. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually been a lot of work, and, and we're, we're thrilled to be on the stage with those folks. Um, there's a lot of work ahead. So if you want to get involved, please, please do. All right, and so, so that's my very, very quick high-level overview. If you want to go through this in DCUS yourself, uh, and Siggy over here in the hoodie uh, wrote this great overview of how to get started in DCUS. It's probably very similar to Abdul's. Uh, a bunch of docs here, um, a Slack room, which is free, so come chat with us. We're here to help. Uh, you can fave my tweets on, on, on Twitter, and you can email me if you really want to, but I don't recommend it. Um, all right, and that, that, that's it for my spiel, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have about any of this. Or I'm also happy to go home and have a beer, so. Yeah. Any questions? All right, well, if there are no questions, I encourage you to say hi to Kiki the dog before you go. She's really nice. All right. Thank you very much. All right, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, thanks to all of our presenters. Let's give them another round of applause. That's great. Um, feel free to stay, talk to people, talk to our presenters, ask them any questions that you have, grab some snacks for the road, um, grab some stickers. We have Mesosphere stickers up here for you guys if you want them. Um, otherwise, thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>